I went to law school and for two, I was working on Wall Street for two years and Julia was working for a fledgling new company called First Artist and she met and uh, became friends with Tony Bill. Tony had a vision and he was telling us that uh, there are all these individuals coming out of film school and nobody will read their scripts or take them seriously. And one of the things that he came across was an idea for a movie about con men by a USC film student, David Ward. Well, of course, this was The Sting, and we decided to pool all our money and try to do this ourselves. When we arrived in Hollywood, the door had opened a crack, possibly because of Easy Rider. Hollywood in the 60s had been struggling, and the conclusion was maybe we should step back a bit and let some of these young kids take a shot with what they like. Brian De Palma lived next door to Julie and I out at the, we lived north of Malibu in a place called Trancas. And he was living with Margot Kidder. And at one point he said to me, there was a journalist who was doing a story on him who had written a script. This was Paul Schrader. And he didn't like it for himself, but he thought it would appeal to me. So he gave me the script and I instantly fell in love with it. I don't believe that one should devote his life to morbid self-attention. I believe that someone should become a person like other people. And this was, I guess, the summer of 73, when I read the script and really loved it and wanted to get involved and brought it to my partners and uh, paid Paul the sum of uh, $1,000 for an option. There were aspects to it, uh, the, the, you know, being into the soul of a man in pain and glimpsing uh, through his diary the mechanism through which uh, how he sees life and how, how he arrives at his decisions was fascinating. And also what I love was the, and we had to fight to keep this, the idea at the end that the difference between a hero and a monster is such a fine line that it's whoever happens to be interpreting, whoever's the first one to say this is what happened, defines it. June 8th, my life has taken another turn again. The days move along with regularity over and over, one day indistinguishable from the next, a long, continuous chain. And suddenly, there is a change. Problem was that it wasn't The Sting. The Sting was a, a classic Hollywood movie, but it certainly wasn't disturbing, like Taxi Driver. And when we, when we took it out to try to put it together, every studio, we'd walk in the door and they'd say, what do you got? And we were greeted with a, you know, a lot of negative response. I hope this card finds you all well as it does me. I hope no one has died. Don't worry about me. One day there'll be a knock on the door and it'll be me. One day Paul Schrader said, you have to see this movie Mean Streets. There's a rough cut screening next week. I can get you in. We went to the screening and I remember midway through I was sold and, uh, you know, talked to Julia and said, not only do we want this director, but we want that actor. We, we saw this cut of Mean Streets and uh, I remember talking, I heard, talking to Julia saying, you know, boy, it should be, you know, Travis Bickle, that's really De Niro, it really is De Niro, it should be Bobby. So after the screening was over, we said to Marty, we wanted to offer this project to the two of them, tied together. And um, they both liked it, they both wanted to do it. Still, it was difficult. We all had to meet, uh, have a measure of success before it could get financed. Uh, and we all did, Each one, all four of us had a success. Fortunately, it all worked in our benefit because every time we would 
lose them, they go off and do something wonderful. Marty did Alice Doesn't Live Here Anymore. Bobby ended up doing uh, The Godfather 2 and winning an Oscar. I see Taxi Driver as something that became a bargain. David Beagleman was the head of the studio, and I'm really grateful that he financed the film. At some level, as a businessman, he thought getting this guy won an Academy Award and a talented director, and really it just ripened. It, it like a piece of fruit. It got at one point, it got to be attractive. Wait a second, I want to talk to you. Look, Don't just wait a second. We couldn't offer them a start date, so we don't want to lose Marty for a year because a lot can happen, all of it bad, if you wait a year. And Marty had to delay again because he was going to do a project with Marlon Brando about Indians. This was a traumatic time for the taxi driver team, and he was ducking me, and I was chasing him around town, leaving notes on his car, <laughs> trying to guilt trip him into not doing the Indian movie. Everybody got available, the budget was right, and we had we were in a little bit of a honeymoon with Columbia because we had just brought them Close Encounters, uh, and they, uh, which they were in competition with another studio, and we, we gave it to them. So just on that day, everything lit green, and we got a yes from Columbia. I got some bad ideas in my head. Keep your hands up, okay? Then just leave. Hang on. It was my baby. Uh, I had to fight for it and be with it every step of the way. It was my role in our partnership to be the on-set producer. It was um, not a favored picture at Columbia. There was just tremendous amount of heat, and I'm glad we were shooting in New York because that 3,000 miles kind of saved us from uh, too much intervention. I do whatever I can do to help the director make the best film he's capable of. In this case with Marty, there were no surprises because all through preparation, we knew what the approach was going to be in every um, sequence. You know, for, for instance, the gun salesman, Steve Prince, a friend of Marty's. Uh, this is a case where Marty allowed the actor to do a lot of improvisation. There you go. It's a premium high resale weapon. He wasn't an actor. I was nervous. Look at that. You know, he was a friend of the director's and was, didn't have a lot in the way of screen credits and uh, had to hold his own in a one on one scene with, uh, with Bobby. 350 for the Magnum, 250 for the 38. But Marty knew something about Stephen Prince and what he could get out of him, and he knew that it would be an unpredictable, surprising performance. How about dope? Grass, ash, coke, mescaline, downers, nebutol, tonal, chloral hydrates. It's more than I had hoped it would be. I loved the script, but Marty brought another layer to it that only he could bring. And, um, and I love the fact that people still to this day, 30 years later, talk about it, are influenced by it, single it out as, uh, as a film, one of their favorites. And I hope that it inspires filmmakers to uh, break new boundaries and go for something that is not a formula. It violates a lot of traditional rules of screenwriting and movie making. Uh, but I think that if you work with your heart, as opposed to a little bit from your head to stay on track, but if primary impulse is coming from your heart, you have a chance of creating something that people really feel will be affected by. It was a film that, if you, if you had the patience, uh, it's a film that came from the heart. It came from uh, meaning that uh, it was something that was a personal project, really. Um, and I'm speaking that way as a director, but primarily I did not write it. I mean, Paul Schrader wrote it. He lived those feelings. I lived those feelings. He was able to express them a certain way, and I, I just became enamored of it and um, fought to get it on the screen um, the way he wrote it, the way uh, we envisioned it, in a way. Paul, myself, De Niro, everybody involved with the project. The script was given to me by Brian De Palma. And he thought it was a wonderful script and uh, thought it would be something that I should direct. But of course, at that point in time, I hadn't really directed any uh, uh, 
um, films of note. Uh, I directed an independent feature over a period of several years called Who's That Knocking at My Door, which wasn't very successful. And um, uh, then an uh, exploitation film for Roger Corman called Boxcar Bertha. And they really weren't the credentials uh, to uh, um, get a studio to back me or had the producers of the film, which were uh, Michael and Julia Phillips, who were very good, great producers and uh, very supportive throughout the whole picture. But there really wasn't anything to bank on there to, you know, tus trailers. You know, visita walk around tell her I want to do the picture. And she said, well, come back when you've done something more than Boxcar Bertha. And she was quite right. But then they saw the um, rough cut of Mean Streets, a rough cut of it. And uh, they changed their minds. It was really a nice, uh, very nice time for us, about 1972, 73, I think. Because the subject matter at the time, even at that time, was um, kind of um, difficult subject matter for a studio. And with the right, with the right budget, and with the combination of me and De Niro coming off of Mean Streets, they thought they might have the possibility of making the picture. I remember talking to Dustin Hoffman about it first. He was about to do Lenny at that time. And I think then there was talk of other actors. But when um, I think De Niro was off on another picture or something, I, well, it was, I think it was Godfather too. <laughs> so, you know, but um, when it worked out that uh, Bob w was willing to do it and the studio seeing Mean Streets, buying Mean Streets, actually Warner Brothers, and then having me do Alice Doesn't Live Here Anymore, which was a more commercial picture in a sense. Um, and that was successful. So we had the possibility then of making the picture. But even then, the budget was really con constricted at that time. We just wanted to make the film. We felt very passionate about the, the script. And um, we even thought, Michael and Julia Phillips and myself, we thought of making the film in, in video, if need be, on video, and uh, in black and white video. There was talk of doing it in a different city, but then it wouldn't be the same. The taxi systems in other cities in America are different to a certain extent. Um, so we knew we had to stay in New York, and it was pretty expensive. And the script was so tight and so strong that it made it very clear in my mind as, as to how the picture should look. And really, it comes from Schrader's uh, vision in, in, in the telling of the story. And ultimately, I realized that visually, we should pretty much see everything from Travis's point of view. Not that anybody else's thought process or frame of mind really enter into the film. And this would isolate him more and put you more on his side, so to speak. And not that we were looking for that, but meaning that it just seemed to me, no matter what the character is, that you're sort of, you're going along the journey with that character. You may like the character, you may not, but it's uh, um, just that you're interested in the character. We certainly felt De Niro, myself, and uh, sort of Chapman, you know, we felt very strongly about the, the emotions that the story created in us, in a way that evoked from us. And it, it made us very passionate about, about making the film and making the best film we could make under the circumstances. And then, of course, defending it in the editing, too, that became a big issue. But it's um, interesting to note, I think, that it was a film that we didn't think was going to be seen by anybody. We just had to make it. We didn't think it was going to be successful. Uh, financially, and it was. And we didn't think it was going to be recognized uh, critically, and it was. We just had to make it. We were going on to make other pictures. At that time, I was thinking of doing, you know, uh, different genre-type based films in the Hollywood studios. What was left of the studio system at the time was very little. And the process was all changing, and we were part of that change. Coppola, Bogdanovich, and Friedkin were already there. And then was, was Lucas, Spielberg, myself, Paul Schrader, John Milius, and um, a number of others, I'm, I may be forgetting a few, but, but uh, the things, be, we began to change things. Um, it was in the doing of it. You know, this film comes out of a very special time, but we thought we were also going to change the genres. And I think probably Lucas and Spielberg were the ones who were most successful at that, meaning they took the genres from the past and recreated them for the new. If we can say it was, a, in a way, to carry on a line through the cinema of the past, or that cinema of the present that was important to us at the time. And so that if people are interested in the film and why a certain shot is a certain way, we'd say, well, it kind of relates to certain shots in Jean-Luc Godard's picture at that time, but they're way beyond me. I can't I begin to even begin to think about what the Godard pictures are, what they're about, or, you know. I mean, I just react in certain ways emotionally to the, the ones he made in the 60s and, and through the, into the 70s. And so 
uh, there was a certain uh, detachment that was interesting to me in the way he shot certain scenes, yet they were very powerful and emotional. There's also a reference, not really a reference, but a very strong influence of Fassbender's work on me at that time in Taxi Driver. So two or three of his pictures. And there was a certain honesty about the shooting. Again, I can't quite tell you, I, I can't tell you what the films, I can't analyze the films, I can't tell you what they're about or whatever, but I had a certain emotion, emotional reaction to, uh, to The Merchant of Four Seasons, for example, when I saw that. I've only seen it once or twice, but uh, I don't really, I'm not a... Um, Film critic, I, I can't, I can't, I don't know exactly where Fassman was going, but I admire, I admire his work a lot, and I admire his, uh, his extraordinary blocking and work with actors, and uh, uh, and so that film had a certain sort of power and honesty to me, and that kind of the spirit of that, the spirit of that picture um, uh, permeates uh, the attitude towards a lot of the, sh the scenes in Taxi Driver, the way I approach the scenes, but that, I mean that means everything, shooting directing the actors, everything. It just, it just kept me, it gave me, it freed me, in a way. There's also very powerful references and subtext to Francesco Rossi's films, Salvatore Giuliano and Hands Over the City, uh, which we studied for. I wanted the look, let's say, of Salvatore Giuliano, and I wanted the look of that. That was in black and white, but I wanted the sense of that in color, and Michael Chapman and I studied that. We, um, we studied The Fire Within, Louis Malle's film, looked at that, but primarily Francesco Rossi and The Wrong Man again, Hitchcock, The Wrong Man, which I keep referencing a lot uh, for other people to see in terms of its sense of camera movement, a sense of guilt and paranoia um, through camera movement. And uh, even, even as recently as The Aviator, I screened it again for the actors and for cameramen. There were a lot of films. I didn't go back. Oh, A Bigger Splash, a film made by David Hockney in California by uh, Jack Hazan, his name was. Uh, it was an interesting film. And also, that led to certain angles um, that I thought were interesting, um, which became very flat, head on angles of locations. Uh, and for example, the one I could reference when he dropped somebody off at a hotel, it shot pretty much head on. Um, flat and um, which relates directly to this shot that I'm going to describe, which is uh, Travis's car in front of the grocery store before he commits his first murder. So the linking of the, the sense of the camera being away from the action and just presenting it like a tableau almost. This was very important to me and I, I something for some reason the um, bigger splash uh, had a, a very strong um, relation to that in my mind it sparked that kind of shooting. And so a number of films that we kept uh, dealing with, um, looking at, we'd have screenings uh, prior to the shooting of the picture, Michael Chapman and myself. What made this film special was that I, I really, the precision with, with which uh, Schrader um, was able to create the character, the feelings, the thoughts, uh, the psychological insight, uh, this character of Travis, Travis Bickle. And I just identified with him. We identified with him, and that's all. We understood how he felt. And uh, I mean, disaffected, uh, disillusioned, maybe ostracized from mainstream society. Um, maybe for me in my own personal life, being an outsider, he's an outsider, a loner, a loser to a certain extent. And uh, there was something that touched a chord in me that I felt I could express that with, with, through, the, through the visual interpretation um, through the visual interpretation of, of, of the film, really, yeah. and utilizing the key instrument, really, and, and more than an instrument, it's, it's the, the voice, and that is the, the actor, Robert De Niro, and what he was able to bring to the picture. I think he understood it, too. We never really verbalized it. We can't verbalize it. I mean, I'm verbalizing it now to a certain extent because people have said things to me over the years, you know. <laughs> I mean, I, you know, when I said then, what I put into the picture is different from what I really put into the film. I mean, that was just the spark of it. That was just the beginning. And then something else happens when you're working it out so that uh, it's more intuitive. Um, the hallucinatory idea is definitely a point of view. When a person crosses the line between fantasy and reality, um, Visita mi canal. reality into fantasy, the fantasy is as real as, as, as the reality. 
it's real. The dreams are real. The paranoia is real. The people may not be doing anything against you, but you believe they are. And so that's probably what I was getting at in, in talking about hallucinatory. Well, drug-induced, he drinks a bit. He takes some pills to keep awake. Uh, he's young enough. In a sense, the body's strong. His body is strong. Um, it does change your perception, particularly working at night, and particularly if you take pills to keep you awake, work at night. It creates a, a kind of strange uh, a subterranean, uh, opens a subterranean, I mean, that I, could, I experienced, opens a strange world to you that uh, images, shadows lurking. Uh, but I'm also, I'm also an urban person. I think I see things that way. Um, but if you keep pushing at night and work at night with, without, without drugs, this does something to a person who works at night, especially driving in the streets and not knowing who's going to get into your car. Because when that person gets in your car, that person controls your life in the next 10 minutes, 15 minutes, 20 minutes, tells you where to go. And it's very dangerous, and he's living on the edge, you know. So naturally, things begin to take on a different meaning to him especially at 4.30 in the morning. If Taxi Driver comes out of any genre at all, it's kind of a, kind of a noir, in a way. That was intentional. The, the noir film from 1945 to 1955, ending with Kiss Me Deadly, that first series of noirs going mid-war mid from Double Indemnity to Kiss Me Deadly. Uh, that had a strong effect on me, those, those pictures, because I happened to see them in a theater when I was a kid. You just go to the movie theater, and there was a Western, and then there was this strange thing in black and white where everybody was kind of doomed from the beginning, walking around in trench coats, and yeah, it was pretty rough stuff for kids to see. Um, and so there was a direct line there, too, to the noir film, but also to the, to the uh, European cinema. There's no doubt, no doubt, French, uh, French Italian. British, to a certain extent. Um, and so this comes. This film comes out of a time that uh, was a great influence of foreign cinema on American filmmakers. Um, but also, primarily, I guess, thing to um, to understand is that it, it was labor of love, and that we hadn't expected any any uh, success from it. Well, I think personal filmmaking always considers the audience, because you are the audience. You really are. Who are you telling the story to? You're going to be telling your story to somebody who want to listen, we hope. Who want to watch, who want to experience, I should say. So, um, personal filmmaking, and the best kind, I think, opens uh, a, a, a line of communication with people in the audience that you don't expect from, in the case of Taxi Driver, it was from people in America to people in Mongolia. I was in China in 1984. And a young man was asking me questions. He came from Mongolia. He was asking me questions repeatedly about Taxi Driver. Ultimately ending in the uh, uh, question, what do you do about the loneliness? And so, I mean, this was something, this is a picture that I hadn't expected for people to, to identify with, but it touched a nerve, and that's what Schrader wrote in terms of the character, Travis Bickle, and the way De Niro acted it. I think there's a certain truth about, uh, there's a certain truth that Schrader hit upon in depicting the character of Travis. I still can't really verbalize it. I mean, the you know, way I can express it is this extraordinary reaction I had when I first read Notes from Underground, Fyodor uh, Dostoevsky. And that, I felt, was, um, was something that I said, oh, I, I had many of those feelings, and that's me. You know, a lot of people do that. And I was talking to the novelist Russell Banks. He said, me too. That's, everybody feels that way when they read that. So I don't know if everybody does, but um, it hit me. And I think Taxi Driver, when I read the script, hit me in a similar way, struck me in a similar way. That, and, and they use the words hit, strike, because it's a violent feeling. And it's, it's an angry feeling, there's no doubt. Um, but it depends on one, how one deals with it. And Travis just does it the wrong way. There's no doubt about it. But again, disaffected, ostracized, outsider, inability to... to to have a relationship with people. I mean, a lot of this is just something that, you know, from my own life that I found in, in Travis. Well, the, the thing about it is that, of course, we found it very special. 
But we didn't say everybody feels this way. We thought we did. We, were the only, <laughs> we thought we <were> <laughs> <laughs> we thought we were like unique in this. Then we just felt, Jesus, we you know really feel bad and uh, we're really upset. And this is the, how we feel about life and things. And um, and it was really part. Of, maybe part of it was a, a coming of age process for all of us. Schrader, myself, De Niro, and maybe part of that. Maybe that's a similar thing for younger people watching the film who are affected by it. Maybe it's part of a coming of age process. The thing is not to get stuck there. One can have those feelings and not cross the line. It's just being honest with yourself and truthful, that's all. Whatever else Taxi Driver is or isn't, it is a kind of documentary of what New York looked like in 1975. And that's the thing that movies do. They are, they, they can be a kind of archaeology of the recent past. Uh, and it, it's a very valuable thing that movies can do. Uh, they're the, almost just like still photos, you know, used to be. And you can say that with Taxi Drive. You can say, oh, that's what Times Square once looked like. You know, and it's a very useful and, and uh, kind of permanent thing that movies do. And, and it's not given, they're not, you not really given credit in a way for that. In the 70s, New York was at its sort of nadir. It was really scummy and awful. Uh, in the 70s, uh, and uh, when I came into uh, office, Times Square was squalid, uh, crime-ridden, uh, uh, porno stores uh, everywhere, and the taxes uh, on the major uh, block, uh, which was 7th Avenue to 8th Avenue on 42nd Street, brought in a total of $5 million in real estate uh, taxes, uh, along with sales tax as well. Well, you have to understand, uh, pornography, um, which has been with us uh, since uh, uh, Pompeii, you can go to uh, Pompeii, uh, that was destroyed in Italy, and you will find pornographic figures that they point out to. Um, and you have lots of people uh, who look at pornography, but it is not healthy for families and for children. When I first went to New York as a teenager uh, in 1953, as a, as a uh, freshman at Columbia, uh, Times Square was, was scummy and awful and everything, but it also had a whole series of, on 42nd Street, a whole series of movie theaters where you could see movies for a quarter. And you could, see a, you could see a movie for a quarter. Uh, I mean, I may be wrong about that, but I don't think so. I think it was something like 25 cents during the day. And then go to a, there were a couple of little uh, hamburger stands where you could have a beer and a hamburger for less than a dollar. And then you could go see another movie. You could spend the whole day seeing movies and have, break, have lunch for three, two or three dollars. And that was, I mean, I saw hundreds of movies there because it was straight down the IRT from 116th Street to 42nd Street. And it was uh, very much my education in movies was the, the cheesy movie theaters on 42nd Street and the, and the sort of cheesy bars and things where you could eat and drink. And I missed that. Yeah, I think that's too bad. It's not for me. I mean, at my age, I don't need that anymore. But I, I think it's too bad that they don't have that anymore. Yeah, I, and the disinfication of, of Times Square is awful. The disinfication of all of Manhattan is awful. Because we changed it, and I'm proud of the fact that it was my administration that created uh, the plan for the change. Um, and we were unable to implement the plan uh, because people brought 47 lawsuits to stop us and it took 10 years. And we won every one of the lawsuits, but in 10 years the economics changed so there weren't tenants willing to come in. And uh, that changed again under uh, uh, David uh, Dinkins, uh, one of the last things uh, he did before leaving office was uh, to uh, sign uh, leases uh, with Disney. But the nature of the businesses has changed. And so the porno shops, basically, I think there are still a couple there. Um, and Giuliani led the fight uh, on that and was almost totally successful um, in eliminating them. Uh, but uh, today, uh, it is a place uh, for uh, families to come in total safety and for individuals looking for a good time. <laughs> Taxi driver is not exactly a hymn to New York because it's pretty unpleasant. But 
we felt free to just sort of be there in New York and float around in it the way Godard floated around in Paris. And, and Raoul Coutard, by the way, floated around in Paris. There is no Godard without Raoul Coutard. I want to put in a plug for the, one of the great cameramen of the world and of the history of cinema. And there certainly would be, those Godard movies wouldn't exist without Raoul Coutard. And I'm no Raoul Coutard, I hasten to say, but I got from him that, that that freedom and from God, that freedom that you can just go out there and turn the camera on and look at the city and, and that city will give you that stuff. I mean, look at those, those shots of people in Times Square, the, the hookers and the people, you know, we just aimed the camera and the, and the city did the, the acting and did the, did the directing, did everything in a way. No, sorry, Marty, I don't mean they did the directing, but you know what I mean. The movie Taxi Driver uh, was a magnificent movie. It, uh, was the seamy side of the city of uh, New York, but we have a seamy side as well as a glorious side, and the uh, latter is far bigger uh, than the former. Um, and uh, I enjoyed the uh, picture uh, immensely. New York City is the uh, apple of God's eye. Uh, in the sense uh, that we're so lucky we live here. That's why everybody wants to come here. It's uh, the place of opportunity. God bless New York City. I storyboarded the picture because I really liked, when I was a kid, I, uh, having the asthma at that time was a very serious thing. And I was always kept off from playing any physical games, really, or really being with many other kids. So I, I started to draw pictures and started to make up stories and that sort of thing. And uh, the process of visualizing a scene alone in a room, a small room, uh, drawing little pictures. In some cases, the picture's very elaborate. In other cases, they're little stick figures, maybe. It's just an eye and an arrow. That is like the most essential process of making the film, even if I don't ultimately use, utilize, all those shots, because yeah. it's a it's a process that I've interpreted the picture in a way um, in my head, and I, I kind of know how to see it. Part of that is uh, part of that is is uh, security. Then when you go on a set, fairly secure, I feel that I can tell people what I want. Then it's a matter of letting go of that security, which means that I think I know what I want, but I'd like to see what else I could get <laughs> with the actors, with the cameraman, with everybody else, uh, and how far you can go that way too. But you have your basis, and a lot of it—a lot of it had to do with, um, uh, particularly in low-budget filmmaking, uh, a lot of people don't use storyboards um, or, or drawings or notes. They, they, you know, are able to—they have the gift of, of working it out there on the spot. For me, I don't want the plug to be pulled in any way, so at least I knew I had to get certain shots in order to tell the story, if I was telling a story. Um, and in most cases, I am. It, that's not easy to do, even up now to the film I just finished, The Departed. Very difficult to tell a story and also to, to, to keep a plot going. Very, very hard, I found. Uh, I always find it difficult, but that's part of the process. And the thing is, there's sometimes you come up with ways of visualizing something that um, just uh, uh, is joyful. And it, it's really, it's a really wonderful feeling and uh, kind of smile. And if you have a DP like uh, Chapman, say, a number of other that I've worked with over the years, a couple of others, you know, that you, you know, you say, well, let's, now we're going to do that shot that starts here and that goes there and it comes back here and then he turns this way and it's fantastic. And if the actors are working with you and, and if the scene, meaning that if the scene with, that you haven't found anything, you haven't found anything, let's say, more interesting through, an, through work with the, the actors and the writer and you haven't changed it a lot, but you still have the ability to uh, put on film this, this initial uh, expression of, of uh, pleasure of filmmaking, in a way. You know, whether it's good or bad, I don't know, but that's what it is. All I know is that sometimes there's a certain joy when these things come out, you know, just how, especially from, if you haven't worked on the script yourself, or if you, if you have, it's, it's interesting because as you're working on the script yourself with a writer or writing your own, you, you can visualize it as you go. Meaning that if we have, if I had planned 14 shots for the day, and it's about four o'clock and we're only on shot three, we know we have a problem. We have to drop two or three other shots, or combine two, 
or do them at some other time, keeping your, you're keeping uh, in a way your nose above the water in a way, so it doesn't you don't get submerged in the picture, uh, where the uh, the process of the filmmaking uh, sinks the entire cast and crew. Notice anything? No. That taxi driver's been staring at us. What taxi driver? That one, the one that's sitting there. How long has he been there? I don't know, but it feels like a long time. But with uh, other work, meaning a script by like Paul Schrader, for example, the way he literally put the words on the page created in me a certain reaction, a visual sense um, that made me see things a certain way, and it clarified a lot for me, and it just cut away excess. I thought that was pretty interesting. And so that, for me, is what the storyboards are for. with the brush. Yeah, it's blush on it. Travis! Hey, it was... That's blush on My wife uses it. Hey, it's Travis. He's a lady. You run all over town, don't you, Travis? Travis? Travis. Lots of shit around. I never use mine. I'm conservative, you know? But it's a good thing to have just as a threat. Well, I'm gonna go do my dirt. The guy was a midget. The blonde was the lady. Oh, the, uh, I, I mean, the lady. Those yeah. midgets are funny. <laughs> Sometimes I like to hold a midget. Yeah? I mean, they're funny. They always want to sit in the front seat. Then I pick up these two fags, you know, they're going, they're going downtown. They're wearing these rhinestone t-shirts. They start arguing. They start yelling. The other says, you bitch, you always start beating them on the head. I say, look, I don't care what you do in the privacy of your own home behind closed doors. This is an American free country. We've got a pursuit of happiness thing. You're consenting, you're adult. But, and, you know, uh, you know, they're my fucking cab. Don't go busting heads, you know what I mean? God love you. Do what you want. Tell them to go to California. Because out in California, when two fags split up, one's got to pay the other one alimony. Not bad. Mm. Well, they're way ahead out there, you know, in California. So I had to get out of the fucking cab. You know, one time I saw a cop chase after this guy with one leg. He was on crutches, you know. The and cop, the, the cop? No, 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 no. The dude that he was chasing. Fucking cops, they chase anything. Hey, Travis. Hey, you got that five, you owe me? My man is loaded, loaded. 
I'd be broke tonight if I hadn't caught me some people from Ohio out at Kennedy. I took them into Manhattan my way along Long Beach. Tipped me five dollars. What's the action around? Very slow. I'm shoving on. Wait, wait. Can I talk to you for a second? Bye, killer. Thank you, nice. Y tus trailers, visita mi canal. <risa>